Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, well, thank you for being here. Um, today, we have Kat Tiedenberg from the University of Tallinn in Estonia, who has been an intern with us this summer who is presenting her work about representations of pregnancy on Instagram. Hi. Um, so yes, my name is Kat Tiedenberg. Um, I'm from Estonia, University of Tallinn. Um, and I'm getting ready to be done with my dissertation, um, which by and large um, has focused on what we do on the internet um, and how it influences our sense of self and our personal identity. Now, more than anything, I've been studying how the photos we take and edit and share and fight about and comment on, um, how those influence what we think about ourselves, what we think about other people, how we come together, how we interact, how we form communities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if you're interested in uh, what I've published uh, in that department, then I'm pretty Googleable, um, and I do tend to put stuff up on my academia page. This summer, I've had the wonderful opportunity of working with all of you guys here at Social Media Collective uh, at MSR uh, under the watchful, loving gaze of um, Nancy Bay. And for this, I will be eternally grateful. Okay. So today I will be talking about pregnancy uh, and more particularly about how pregnancy is visualized in our digitally saturated environment and even more specifically about how women themselves present um, their pregnancy by using their smartphones and uploading their photos on the internet. Now historically, pregnancy has always been either a matter of fact thing, something that a woman has to do, or something that is hidden, especially in the Victorian era. For example, doctors then worked by touch, and during birth maintained eye contact uh, to preserve the woman's modesty. And in America specifically, during the Victorian time, women had to uh, withdraw from the public eye when their bellies became visible. Now, in the Western visual tradition, uh, maternal body has been uh, conceptualized primarily as a container uh, for the unborn child. And the central mode of representation for this is that of the Christian maternal ideal of the sacred vessel. Over the past 20 years, however, pregnancy has become quite visible, and there are a couple of things that this can be attributed to, one of those is the sonogramming technology. So while ultrasound became suitable for medical use in the late 50s, uh, it didn't become widely used in American and British hospitals until the end of 70s. And in the maternity hospitals, it, was, it started being used in the late 20th century. Now, the second thing that uh, the, this visibility of pregnancy can be attributed to is the fact that in 1991, um, a naked and very pregnant Demi Moore was on cover of Vanity Fair. And a lot of people got really upset by that, but it also kind of jump-started this trend of celebrities uh, flaunting their pregnancies. Uh, so pregnancy, as long as the woman who is pregnant uh, was attractive while she was pregnant became a spectacle of sorts. Now, both of these things come with uh, a certain level of surveillance. The fetal sonogramming is conceptualized by feminist scholarship as a form of surveillance that renders a woman's body basically, again, just the container for the fetus and something that is to be judged physically and morally for its suitability to be that container. So that jump starts a discourse of fetal rights, which kind of misplaces the woman or erases the woman from this conversation. And the woman ends up with just a bunch of um, self-regulatory uh, practices that she has to discipline herself against. Now, the other form of surveillance that comes from the lovely Demi Moore picture there is that of the body image surveillance during pregnancy. So while uh, in previous times, women during pregnancy weren't really assessed for their um, attractive, 
attraction at how attractive they are. So uh, post the Demi Moore cover, uh, celebrity uh, journals and uh, media has things like celebrity bump watch, which is to monitor what the bellies look like. And there's a lot of um, interest in how fast women bounce back to their pre-baby uh, bodies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this means that by and large, we can say that there are uh, there's like a crossfire of various expert knowledges that women have to manage their pregnancies within. Now, expert knowledges are the knowledges which by consensus uh, carry more weight than others, either because they explain the world better for the purposes at hand, uh, or because they are associated with a stronger power base, and usually both. Now, to name a few of these expert knowledges about pregnancy, we can talk about the medical surveillance uh, discourse, which uh, puts the fetus first and basically gives the woman the role of an informed patient who has to make correct choices. Uh, the celebrity culture give us the yum, gives us the yummy mummy um, image, which means that you should look hot while you're pregnant. Um, then there is the uh, overarching discourse of self-discipline, which means that you have to eat right, you have to exercise right. Um, and then there's the new age or spiritual discourse, which says that it's not enough to, own, uh, to act correctly, you also have to feel correctly. So that one is about the uh, prenatal bonding and um, mantras uh, about your fetus and things like that. Now, there is probably no one in this room that needs to be convinced that people kind of like the internet. Uh, and, you know, it creates for us the feeling that the world is at our fingertips. It gives us instant gratification. It gives us validation. It allows us to form meaningful and less meaningful um, connections to other people. So pregnancy also gets a significant airtime online. There are advice forums uh, where women can seek advice and give advice. There are apps and websites that help you track your pregnancy, give you information that we used to get from pregnancy books. Um, and of course, there are social media where pregnant women can share their experiences, and uh, they very often do so in the form of photos. So this summer, this is what I've been doing. I've been looking at the photos that the pregnant women share. Uh, and I've been looking at that on Instagram. Now, Instagram is a mobile uh, image sharing app which allows you to upload videos and photos, edit them, uh, add captions and tags, um, and then other people can comment on them, like them, and follow you. It was uh, founded in 2010. It was sold to Facebook for $1 billion in 2012. And this summer, um, it has uh, about 200 million monthly users. Uh, and the statistics from last year are that about uh, 19 or 17 percent of internet users are on Instagram. Uh, now, I suggest that Instagram, uh, as it is used by the non-celebrity users, uh, is basically the digital incarnation of snapshot photography and family photography. Uh, the historians of photography have uh, said that snapshot photography has very specific characteristics. So it usually focuses on uh, leisurely uh, and happy activities, and it usually erases the mundane, the work-related, the sad. Uh, according to Bourdieu, looking at snapshot photography, we can find out what collective uh, moral and uh, aesthetical values deem photographable. So, uh, and family photography, which is a subset of snapshot photography, is uh, particularly homogenous. So researchers who have looked at family albums throughout the world find very little variation. But this um, repetition shouldn't be easily dismissed because basically we can say that this is how fa happy families are made, happy families are constructed. So um, this is why I find it to be particularly suitable to examine images. Uh, because it helps us uncover the kind of meetings of the po and the possible tensions of the big narratives or the expert knowledges and the ones that people carry in their own head. 
Okay. So in order to look at how uh, women conform to or resist these expert knowledges or existing discourses on pregnancy and uh, what we find photographable about pregnancy, uh, I scraped in Instagram for accounts uh, by people who speak Russian and people who speak English, and I scraped it using tag words. And shout out to Dr. Gregory Minton for helping me with the scraping tool. Um, I am co cooperating with Sir Liu to uh, have like a bird's eye view at all of this data, but what I'm talking about today um, relies on a more in-depth qualitative look at segments of all of this. Now, I wanted to know how women themselves present their pregnancies, what kinds of pregnancy stories are uh, particularly well suited to be told through images and whether Instagram as a platform uh, is conducive to representing pregnancy in a certain way. I will tell you a little bit now about the general findings, and then I will show you how women's presentations of pregnancy have a distinctly moral character. And after that, I will show you how Russian women, specifically in their form of doing it right, perform a very specific stereotypical form of femininity and why I think they have to feel that they have to do that. And of course, I would um, appreciate everyone's comments and thoughts in the end. OK, so in terms of the content of the images, um, pregnancy Instagrams resemble other personal Instagrams. There are selfies. There are pictures of people's cats and dogs and food, places they visit, concerts they go to, friends, family, et cetera, et cetera. Additionally, there are the baby bump pics or the belly pics, which are usually mirror shots or uh, photos taken with your webcam. People are posing sideways in order to show um, how their belly is growing. Um, sometimes it happens, and it's quite common in the accounts that I've looked at, that pregnancy slowly throughout the duration of it overtakes the Instagram. So people start referencing being pregnant in captioning and tagging images that are not bump pictures. So you can just take a selfie or you can take a picture of your food, but instead of being just a selfie or just a meal, it is now a pregnancy salad or something like that. Uh, now, to my surprise, uh, the English-speaking and the Russian-speaking accounts were not that different. But there were some quite interesting differences in the details. For example, um, English-speaking women started referring to their fetuses by the first name that they selected for their babies very early in the pregnancy and did that throughout. So you would, you would see a sonogram image, or you would see a belly picture, or you would see a onesie that they had bought, and it would be for little Johnny or little Marissa or whatever else the baby was supposed to be called. Russian women never did that. Never once did I see that. They did, however, also reference um, their children in other ways than the fetus. Uh, <laughs> but they usually used uh, cutesy names like my princess or my hero, and they were very um, stereotypically gendered. Um, Russian women almost never referenced, it, referenced their stance on things like breastfeeding uh, during their pregnancy Instagram, while uh, English-speaking women, those who uh, refer to themselves as lactivists, started talking about that already during pregnancy. So preemptively, without knowing if they are going to be physically capable of breastfeeding, they were very adamant that they are going to breastfeed and co-sleep and do all those things. Yes? Excuse me? Are they all first-time pregnancies? Uh, these that are, that this sample is on, yes, they are. The larger sample, there are different kinds. Um, so... Both Russian and, and English-speaking women cited very heavily from the celebrity culture of styling the bump, buying the maternity clothing, um, trying to maintain your body, buying all kinds of cosmetics, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, right. Um, pregnancy photo shoots, which means that you hire a professional photographer and go somewhere and take pictures of your, of your um, growing belly, 
uh, are quite popular among both, but I think more popular among uh, Russian-speaking uh, women. And they do also tend to post more of those images. In some cases, they even reference, I need to be able to post the last of my photo shoot before I go into labor. So uh, it's important. However, the, uh, amongst the English-speaking accounts, there were more cases for various ritualistic behavior. So there was a, a ritualistic announcement of pregnancy by a staged photo that they did themselves. There was often a gender reveal. Pets uh, had a great deal in revealing the genders. Um, pets were also often photographed with signs, I am going to be a big sister. Um, um, and things like that. Um, Russian women um, gave more airtime to their husbands, talked about their husbands or their baby daddies more, and we're going to come back to why that is later. Okay, so how do women, women on Instagram do pregnancy right? How do they do the, the moral elements of it? Moral regulation means that social order is, a specific kind of social order is normalized um, through cultural and discursive practices um, that delimit and set boundaries uh, on certain kinds of seeing, representing, and thinking. So some kinds become more plausible and others become less plausible and less acceptable. Now motherhood and pregnancy are both highly morally regulated because they have to do with reproducing people and the dominant systems. Now previous scholarship has shown that um, the process of doing pregnancy includes three things. One is the process of learning to be pregnant. So reading books, asking other people about it. The second is the process of mastering the daily routines of self-care and self-discipline. So what you're supposed to eat, what you're supposed to uh, drink, how you're supposed to sleep, etc. And the third one is the constant performing of pregnancy, which ensures that the process of doing pregnancy is publicly acknowledged. Now, all of these are evident on Instagram. Um, in the early stages of pregnancy, women have to learn how to um, start telling time in weeks, which we normally don't do in our tradition. Um, they have to learn about um, what stage of development their fetus is at and what types of vitamins they have to take to make sure they make a smart baby. This is all uh, made visible uh, by posting screen caps of the various tracking apps that the women use for this. Um, and the, the act of making this vi visible is in part showing the progress of the pr process, uh, but in part also just showing that I am taking my education seriously. I'm taking it seriously that I have to learn doing this. Um, they post images of their food with ref references to the nutritional value. For example, I'm going to read you a caption. Eating six dates a day in last month of pregnancy is supposed to reduce the need for induction and reduce labor by up to seven hours. Totally worth it, but these things look like dead cockroaches. And it's tagged with dates, augmentation, induction, labor, fit pregnancy, healthy pregnancy, cockroach, and gross. <laughs> so here we see two things happening. Again, one is um, the self-care, what you're supposed to do, and the other is uh, already tapping into the discourse of self-sacrifice, which um, is very important in, um, in, the, in the moralizing aspect of pregnancy. Um, they feel suitably guilty for indulging in unhealthy snacks and try to neutralize their own behavior uh, or their own role in this unmotherly behavior by making it the fetus who craves it. So just like we can make a baby wait, we can also m make it the baby who really wanted to eat those 12 donuts. Um, they reference the need to, uh, to exercise and catalog their visits to the gym or take pictures of their wristbands showing how many steps they took. Um, and uh, they post images of wine glasses filled with cranberry juice and virgin cocktails at bars. Um, and the inability to sleep on their stomachs, all in order to internalize, but also to make visible the self-sacrifice that the intensive mothering discourse carries. Now, this all could be put together under the heading of uh, doing preg pregnancy right in, in becoming a high-quality container. Oh, so 
sorry. Now the second aspect of doing it right can be called yummy mummy in training. So that one uh, relies more on the body image and celebrity uh, culture aspects of it. So these endeavors uh, mean that they, they try to style the bump uh, with fashionable maternity wear and accentuate the fact that they are uh, not fat, pregnant, that they have only gained weight in the right places, which is the belly and the breasts. Um, the, even the visual aspects of the images often cite from um, celebrity magazine covers um, of celebrities who are pregnant, etc. Now, this intensive mothering and ultimate love for, un, for one's unborn child, in this case, is manifested through buying a lot of stuff, basically buying all the stuff. So a lot of uh, baby clothes, baby furniture, baby toys, um, everything imaginable is bought, photographed, and uploaded, and then um, squeed on um, by each other. Now, those women who are less fortunate in terms of their pregnancy weight gain uh, can make up for their inability to conform uh, with the I swallowed a basketball um, narrative by wearing flowing maternity frocks, uh, focusing their pictures more on the boobs and face area, and uh, compensating by buying even more things. OK. Now, what about women who, for some reason, can't or uh, are unable to, uh, to do that, who don't have the social or the material or other resources to reproduce these dominant narratives of pregnancy? There were some of them in my sample, um, single mothers, teenage mothers, women with um, health issues, recovering drug addicts or alcoholics. But none of them actively seem to want to resist the narrative of moralization of pregnancy. Rather, it seems that they perceived it, uh, it as a handicap that they had to uh, compensate somehow. And throughout their pregnancies and Instagramming it, the process they found, um, they, they found a way to kind of still subscribe um, to the identity of good mother-to-be. In some cases, it meant, uh, for example, uh, if you wanted to compensate for your lack of ability to buy all these things, you could do that by... Um, focusing more on the new agey spiritual aspect of it by posting a lot of um, ode-like dedications to the unborn child um, or mantra-like um, sayings about the child or for the child. Uh, on the screen, you see two outtakes from a woman uh, with an eating disorder. And her Instagram account was a pro-Anna Instagram account before she found out that she was pregnant. Now, the top one... Uh, she is. Uh, she has just recently found out that she's pregnant, and um, she writes, I gained three pounds, but I got to eat for the baby. My anxiety is so high right now, but my first doctor's appointment is on the 15th, so I want to lose like eight pounds by then. I just want to be skinny. On top of it, the baby daddy is being an ass. He says he needs more time, and work is killing me. I'm so tired and sick all the time. I miss my fasting and losing weight. I'm going to get so fat. And it's tagged with girls with tattoos, girls with curves, I want bones, Anna, Mia, eating disorders, fat, pregnant, mommy-to-be, hate myself, unhappy. Now, three months later, she has posted the picture below. And the caption reads, my little alien is growing and my belly's getting big, girl or boy. And the tags are girls with piercings, girls with tattoos, baby bump, babies, love, happy, mommy to be pregnant, pregnancy 16 weeks. So we see that she has incorporated this appropriate way of seeing um, her pregnancy or speaking about her pregnancy and maybe hopefully feeling about her pregnancy um, in this case. OK, so what is it about photos specifically that makes them particularly suitable for this moral regulation of pregnancy? They, photos have historically been used and understood um, as um, in a regime of truth. So as if they are carriers of reality, representations of reality. Now, while visual researchers um, have kind of given up on this approach to photos, I would argue that the vernacular users really haven't. And especially uh, when we have words and 
photos together, they are much more rhetorically persuasive than either text or images separately. Now, not only do the photos allow the women to capture how their belly grows, it allows for them to capture that they're doing everything as they're supposed to do. So they move uh, through swooning over uh, sonogram images to demonstrating that they are well-educated and committed to uh, being an informed patient by posting images of prenatal vitamins and sonogram images. The 3D sonogram images, by the way, have no um, additional medical use. They're just um, there because people want them. Um, to, uh, to snapshots of monitoring apps, to cakes from baby showers. Uh, so it makes the pregnancy work visible. Now, Instagram, because it has a blog-like system where you uh, create an archive that mirrors or loosely follows the kind of narrative timeline of the person's life, is particularly suitable for making pregnancy work visible. Uh, making collages is very popular on Instagram. There are lots of apps for that. People use it intensively. And it allows women to create um, snapshots that collapse nine months of pregnancy into this one tidy, beautiful image of, of the process. Uh, now, because Instagrammers use tags to make their uh, content searchable, and I've noticed in comments um, that people reference that they do search for it and they like other pregnant people's posts, um, we can say that Instagram teaches women a specific, aesthetically driven way of making their pregnancy work visible. So Harry Bernstein, a uh, partner at digital uh, agency The 88, when he was asked to remark on the sale of Instagram to Facebook, uh, said that life looks better on Instagram. So pregnancy sure looks really good on Instagram. OK, so moving towards a more narrow look at all of this, uh, I told you before that the differences between the Russian-speaking and English-speaking uh, accounts were not all that pronounced. Yet there was this kind of elusive, <laughs> lingering flavor to the accounts in Russian that I initially couldn't figure out. The woman's hair was longer, the ruffles were fluffier, the lipstick was always there. Uh, everything seemed to be stereotypically feminine. So I decided it was worth trying to unravel these narratives of more uh, and take a deeper look at what's going on there. So I will be using terms like heteronormity and hegemonic masculinity. And because we do have some people who are not into the feminist lingo, um, heteronormativity refers to practices, assumptions, and norms that render heterosexuality uh, natural, coherent, and privileged. So it constitutes feminine women and masculine men as the only viable options. Everything else is bad and shouldn't exist. And hegemonic masculinity um, means characteristics of masculinity that guarantee the dominant position uh, for men. In simplified terms, it means that men are strong and authoritative, and women are physically vulnerable and compliant. Now, um, to better contextualize the Russian women's performances of pregnancy, it's important to remember that, by and large, Russian culture, perhaps more than many others, places a premium on women's beauty. So that is a way to, to evaluate um, women. And after the harsh economic conditions, um, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, it, there has been a pronounced move towards uh, traditionalism in wider terms. There is also, because of the sharp population decline, an attempt by the politicians to get more women into birthing. And they do that usually by jump-starting symbolic projects like uh, Mother's Day. Or interestingly, they have things like pregnancy beauty pageants, where pregnant women do what women beauty pageants do. Um, and the, 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 the focus of that is to make sure that people believe that pregnant women, too, can be beautiful. Now, it's not too surprising that on Instagram, too, Russian women spend a lot of time and effort on performing being beautiful or, or femininity in a distinctly beautiful way, even when they are pregnant. 
So when you look at Russian-speaking uh, pregnant women's Instagrams, the focus is on beauty. So I have not reproduced people's selfies here because of ethical reasons, but basically there's a barrage of various selfies, most of them highly posed with heavy makeup, very pretty hair. Um, and the process of becoming beautiful is also very public. It's, it's portrayed as an expert knowledge that, is, uh, that one can be proud of. Uh, Russian-speaking women also participate in a special breed of selfies that I've never seen anywhere else, which is I'm waiting for my husband selfie. So it basically looks like any other selfie, but it is tagged with I am waiting for my husband. Now, those are usually uh, also followed by comments uh, that reinforce the reading of the selfie as a um, sign of beauty. So, <gasps> What beauty, oh, sorry, what beauty awaits him um, and praise for things like, you're such a good girl for taking time to, be sh to make sure you're pretty. Okay, and even in terms of when you take the first step into the Russian-speaking women's Instagrams, you are greeted by their, their profile descriptions, so basically the about me part of, Rush of Russian women, and they usually... Uh, default into defining themselves through their husbands or through their relationship with the masculinity. So there are two I've translated. I love my husband so much. Mummy to the best baby ever. Loving and beloved wife. These ones say happy wife and uh, mother to be. And this one just says wife in Russian. Um, now, of course, these women too post their baby bump pictures. But even these are flavored with a special focus on the type of beauty and femininity that is appealing to hegemonic masculinity. So while being a part of the overall narrative of doing it right that we talked about before, Russian women's images um, dip into outright accolades um, to men. So this is, I've changed the pictures that um, I was afraid might be recognizable, so it doesn't look like a comic book originally. Um, there's a young woman, she has wrapped herself into a bed sheet, she's cradling her belly in a way that makes sure that we know that she's pregnant and not fat, and she has tagged it with, my husband tells me that I smile in my sleep and press closer to him, asks me what I'm dreaming of, but he knows that it is thanks to him that there is so much happiness living inside me. He gave us the gift of a son, which makes me incredibly happy. Now, in addition, we see posts of how women would be lost or broken or uh, scared without the love of their man. So the point seems to be that these women's lives become meaningful through their all-encompassing love for their deserving men. Again, uh, this is an example. Again, I altered the image. So she writes, Every woman needs to be dependent on a man, and the more delicate a woman, the more elaborate these forms of dependence have to be. What a pleasure it is when a man saves the day, takes the problems on himself. How happy it makes a woman to hear, I have already thought about it. And how much does it actually mean when a man can simply fall asleep next to you, turning his passion into tenderness? It's also important here that this is an old picture. So while it was posted, the woman was visibly pregnant. And on this image, she is not. She hasn't commented on it. But it is a, not a rare tactic of reminding people of the corporeal or sexual capital that, that the women have while pregnant. Uh, also, we see in the pose where the man is very grabby and the woman is very uh, complacent, so it all adds to the reading of um, this performance. Uh, and the comments, of course, were these words, you are so beautiful, and my personal favorite, if only all girls would appreciate this. Now, what does the husband do? Uh, the only way men are actively portrayed husbanding uh, is through regular extravagant gift giving um, and uh, being the ones who get to judge the women's appearances. So if a woman goes to a salon and comes back, then the, then the, woman, then the man has to put his stamp of approval on it. So if you go and you cut this much off of your hair that is up to this, then it, it's a major source of anxiety because maybe he's not going to like it. Gifts are painstakingly cataloged and uh, showed, and other people on, on Instagram appropriately react, uh, and it becomes a uh, collective endeavor of praising the man for, for being good at what men need to be good at, which is buying gifts. 
Um, right. Okay. So I suggest that what these women do by presenting their femininity in such an emphasized manner is asserting that theirs is a fem femininity of a higher order. Mimi Shippers uh, calls this hegemonic femininity. What this means that uh, it's not only complementary to hegemonic masculinity, uh, and it, with it works to make sure that the, its dominant position is there, but it's also above other kinds of femininities. So, um, people, women who are not uh, sexually interested in men, uh, who are aggressive, things like that, those are. are lesser femininities in that model. So we see this elevation being enacted in how these women chastise others uh, to uh, compliant performances. For example, there was a, a face selfie that I didn't reproduce with a ca ca caption that says, woman is a creature of moods, and these moods influence her entire life. The state of a woman's soul determines the state of her health, her house, her work, and her relationships. And these moods are created for us by men. On top of this, other women referred to in abstract terms as girls or ladies or chicks uh, are cautioned to discipline themselves and to uh, be nice to their men. So there was another selfie that was captioned with girls, be kind, don't nag your husbands. So what? What are we going to do with all of this? Social media and image sharing have uh, been shown by other researchers and my own previous work to have a certain potential at resisting or reappropriating dominant uh, discourses. But this is not the case here. So Instagram seems to sponsor complacency and reproduction of dominant ideologies. Now, what I suggest we take away from this is that a, Instagram seems to lend itself particularly well to making pregnancy work visible. And making pregnancy work visible is one of the pillars of its moral regulation. Pregnant women rely on the self-regulatory discourse of intensive mothering uh, when they try to do pregnancy right on Instagram. It seems that if one does decide to present their pregnancy on Instagram, the only way to do it is to do it right. So I didn't see anyone doing it wrong or doing it in a different way. Uh, building on that, it seems that, and this is quite perverse from the feminist scholarship point of view, that if women want to contest the moralization discourse and the heteronormative ideology, their only choice is to not talk about it. So the guidebook of pregnant femininity seems to prescribe this embellished preening um, as the acceptable way of doing it, and thus leaving us with a questionable choice not to. Also, I propose that presentations of pregnancy quote intensively from whatever the dominant ideology that the teller subscribes to, and through that, it gives us an, an opportunity to kind of reverse engineer um, the ideologies that might be less obvious at other less vulnerable times in people's lives. I would also suggest that in order to be rhetorically persuasive, images, captions, and comments uh, and tags have to harmonize, but can't repeat each other, because that will become tedious. And one way of doing that is to lend from the same ideology or the same grand narrative. And with this, I thank you. You spoke really well to the kind of the ways that pregnancy gets performed that you were able to see by looking at these, right? Sort of the ways that contemporary women sort of find, deal with these pressures. And you talked about <clears throat> what the what Instagram and photography does specifically, like you know, making the composites and that kind of thing. So the other piece that I felt like I wanted to hear was the element of who you're making it public to. So who's who's the audience in this? Because I, I really like the, the observation that pregnancy has always required a kind of public performance, right? I am pregnant, I'm being pregnant the right way, that way may differ from sort of moment to moment, but um, there is this demonstration quality for your doctor, for your family, for your spouse, for your neighbors. Um, 
And then you're in an environment where the ability to make it public and to whom is really quite specific. So I was wondering from what you looked at, you know, is, are these performances, are, do you feel like they're for um, the public? Are they for other pregnant women that are, that are liking and commenting? Is it for their family and their followers? Is it for themselves? Is it for their baby, you know, in the future? How are they articulating who, they're, who it's for? And was that different from Russian and English speaking? They are not articulating who it's for, apart from the few references uh, to, you know, you at tag some of your followers when you have a conversation with them, or uh, in some cases when they reference that they search hashtag information because, and the reason they give is like, I like it. I like seeing how other women are pregnant. Now, by looking at the amount of followers they have um, and the kind of tone in them, I would say that there are some Instagrams that already before were made to be public. So these women have some kinds of um, hobbies or jobs or aspirations that they want to make public anyway. Maybe they're really into crafting, maybe they want to be a stylist or whatever. So they already before becoming pregnant were pushing their stuff out heavily and it is very um, um, very carefully uh, done. Those continue doing that throughout pregnancy. So their audience, I don't think, changes. And the other ones who previously had personal-ish Instagrams, although it remains unknown why they haven't made them private. Uh, and they are aware of the fact that it's not private because they tag it, so they make it searchable. Those f feel like, which is not a very scientific way of approaching this, but they feel like um, they're met for sympathetic audiences. But then again, if we go back to scholarship on blogging, this is how we do it. Like, we, this is the way we experience putting stuff on the internet. That uh, the, the same, the trust <coughs> responsiveness um, theory by Paul Delat um, that says that we assume that our stuff is going to be seen or read by others like us or people who are sympathetic. And if they're not, they're going to turn away. So this is what the Instagrams feel like, too. A lot of them have a lot of followers, too, right? Some have a lot. Some have like an average, like 165 or something like that. So um, I attended an intern talk a week or two with an intern in Redmond who had looked at um, queries by, search queries by pregnant women um, and compared, for example, first time mothers and second time mothers. And I just, I guess one thing that seems like a, a distinction there is that those are done by people, you can sort of see the internal, I guess, thoughts that are like information seeking that aren't for public consumption. I just wondered if you would get a different kind of analysis looking at sort of the, the, the private. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure I would. I think there would be more, maybe more um, insecurities in the private ones, although that is also questionable. I personally have a, 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 a private Instagram where I treat it like a, a family album. So family and friends are basically people who have seen my child. Um, but I, I wouldn't be comfortable with showing my insecurities to these people either. Yeah, well, so, I'm talking about search queries, so these are completely private. Yeah. 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 But on Instagram, it's like already the, f I don't know. I, I wish I could look at a bunch of uh, private pregnancy Instagrams. Maybe I will. Thank you for the talk. Um, I just have a question about the, the like beauty in the Russian ones, especially. Do you have any comparison for how that differs does it change at all when someone is pregnant, or is that just generally how women's? Instagram? I did go back before they were pregnant, so for the same women, I have um, some information about that, and it's basically just how, like, you gotta be pretty. That's the most important thing. So you do pretty first, and then you do other things. I had two comments and a question. One was. Um, it struck me particularly because I'm a little bit familiar with your other work. The place I can think of, you said, like, uh, a thing I've never seen anywhere else is waiting for my husband or waiting for. And I think that that is actually a trope that comes up in, like, S&M photo 
blogs that oh, people you're keep right. of sort of like I'm waiting for my for master, my I'm waiting for my mistress, you know. Um, so just throwing that out there is. A thing. That is very cool. Um, the other, uh, and I'm wary of making that connection between like S and M and, and pregnancy for a bunch of reasons, but uh, so there's that caveat with it. But uh, anyway, um, uh, the other thing I was thinking of when you're talking about privacy. Private, I was thinking of going back maybe to Lang's piece on publicly private and privately public on YouTube and sort of thinking of that as a metric for sort of categorizing some of what's happening here. And I don't know if that would be useful or not, but it sort of struck me with Harold's question of who's the audience. Um, and then the other thing that I just wanted to ask you about is sort of like what would sort of more, like I, I'm with you when you're saying like the only alternative seems to be just not talking about pregnancy. Um, and I was reminded of Janet Bertezzi who's been very public about keeping her privacy, keeping her pregnancy private. Um, uh, so she didn't, if you run away, she like was pregnant and she didn't mention her pregnancy at all in her social media for those nine months. So it was like sort of this thing that she did. And she blogged about it I think on CNN or something. Anyway, um, but can you imagine or have you thought about or are you taking this scholarship in a way of thinking about what it would, what alternatives are there for being on Instagram and being pregnant and still having some sort of alternate narrative of pregnancy or femininity? Um, because I can see a way where that would really contribute to a larger set of questions about is it possible to be on social media and not participate in heteronormative discourses? I've thought about it, and uh, the reason for why I only put the, oh, it seems like we only cannot talk about it if we don't want to add to this, is that I didn't come up with very good alternatives. So one, one thing that I did see a little bit of, and they can see as having elements of, I don't want to call it resistance, but resistance, um, is uh, that you see women who are pregnant, and it's acknowledged that they're pregnant, but the nothing is about being pregnant. So it's like, I am going to a conference. I got a coffee or, you know, the, the things that we do on Instagram anyway. And, and it's not pregnancy coffee and it's not pregnancy uh, uh, concert and, and you don't have the, the measurement one. The thing about it though is that I also feel reluctant to make the kind of call to arms to, for women to not do that because Besides the public presentations of pregnancy, there's also the very personal, physical, emotional, hormonal, blah, 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 experience of being pregnant. And taking, like <clears throat> knowing how your belly grows is not only for the spectacle, it's also for yourself. So to say that by default you doing this is like raining on my down with heteronormativity parade is also kind of um, unfair. So I don't know. Just a second. Um, yes, one, two, three. Uh, the, pri the privacy and, and public thing, what I noticed through the three months that I was looking at this, that I had people who initially had open ones and had closed them down. And it couldn't have been because of what I did, because I did follow them all uh, to make them aware of my following, but that was before. So people just themselves noticed. And the only thing that I could figure out was that when the baby was born. So being pregnant and with the ultrasound images and all, that seemed okay for public consumption. But when the child came out and it had a face and like was a person, then it seemed to no longer be okay. Charlton, Mary. Um, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, and I have several different questions, so I'm just going to ask one and then you know, can rotate. I think it goes to the heteronormativity question, that it would be awfully so common. It seems like it would be awfully hard to imagine a way of opting out of heteronormativity just because we're on social media. So I don't know that that's necessarily an attack to take. As much as I wonder, did you have any sense of um, perhaps different tagging that could have methodologically led you to other ways that people would be constructing their pregnant self? That if that one seems more of a methodological challenge here, that you are specifically following tags, that perhaps um, just, you know, in terms of grammar we have for talking about pregnancy might have made it awfully difficult to be able to see um, anything else other than that. Do you have, have you thought about maybe strategies, maybe some of the work you're doing so, or other ways that you might be able to, to think about um, alternatives to, to the tagging that you would use? Um, well, with the tagging, I try to do what 
what I could with, uh, because when I went in with the words I knew, I kept making my pile of words larger by what the people were using. And because people oftentimes tag the same image with like 12 tag words, I found, uh, especially for the Russian, I found like slang versions of pregnancy and stuff to further take out my search to make sure that I wasn't um, in, so in terms of like social status or something, eliminating people. But it, like there might be subcultures out there that don't use any of the the common tags and those I don't know about. So there is hope that if so is going to be able to make an algorithm that detects a big belly, mm -hmm. we could try that. But I currently this is like wishful thinking. <coughs> Talton, Nancy. I, I was just actually gonna oh, you OK. About it, I mean, it does raise this weird question about whether how heteronormative heteronormativity is, right? Where it might <laughs> be homonormative. But yeah, well, I mean, but there might be like this sad result that like the more you gather, you just like many, many people want to embody these certain stories. Yeah, yeah. And maybe tagging is that like when you tag it pregnancy, you're putting it into, like you're either classifying it, this is my pregnancy photo. Yeah. But if you do like 16 weeks, you're putting it into like yeah, people should yes, find yeah. me yeah. And, and they're all demonstrating, right? So the demonstration yeah. quality of it. Yeah. Because Which is, I, I was struck, I mean, this is sort of a follow on this question but like there's there seems to be nothing to me about Instagram that doesn't allow a, a very different story to be told right if, and, and I'm thinking not just the one that's not heteronormative but like the miserable pregnancy right if you want to break the celebrity and the healthy body and whatever someone's just off like just feels terrible doesn't emotionally click into it is angry it's all not working you can imagine someone who's just like showing pictures of barf and you know like you could do it and but, it's very hard to imagine, right? So is it that, is it that those stories, the celebrity one and the healthy body one and the whatever, are so compelling that people gravitate towards them or use them as ways to make sense of things or need to demonstrate the right version? Or, or we see these pictures and we sort of read them that way, right? That woman with the bump on the side might be like, I've never had a worse day in my life, but we like add it to the bump pile. Or is it that just people don't do that? They don't like show you, I'm gonna show you the ins and outs of this terrible, terrible process. Mm -hmm. So uh, I touched on it a little bit with the pro Anna girl. Yeah. So I think what happens is, and I've been, uh, this is like a big question here. So I think what happens is that, not that the narratives are so compelling, but the narratives are so powerful that uh, again, and also in like a vulnerable state, you don't like, it, it takes, balls of steel to not do that because a lot of your self-worth as a you're entering especially in, for the first time mothers you're entering into into a new role that you don't know how to do and to then enter into it by fighting the the stories that tell you this is how you do it right is very hard so even the ones who do have miserable experiences especially in the first trimester when lots of people feel really bad they change throughout the, the, the posting. So she started with saying like, I'm gonna lose followers because I'm gonna get fat and I can't uh, post on starving myself anymore. Which is, you know, from like a normative perspective, like you don't, you cannot say that about making a baby. And then, you know, two months later it was all, so I don't think they're that compelling, they're just that powerful. The, the moral representations of it. Um. Uh, I'm curious, and I think maybe this speaks a little bit to what Tarleton was saying about audience, but when it came to like learning these narratives or like learning these sort of genre types, was it something that they were picking up from each other or was it, was there ever instances of like external, like Pinterest or something, like Pinterest told me I should have this cake and here's a picture of it or Pinterest told me I should buy these baby clothes kind of that make sense? Uh, that's a good case. I should probably look more at references of other platforms. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I didn't keep my eyes off open specifically for that, uh, which is a really good idea. Thank you. Really um, have you seen any? Like, I saw this over on Pinterest, like, I, Pinterest. Pinterest seems very heteronormative in a very similar way. Like right. The very perfection of the wedding, the baby shower. I saw a lot of pictures of magazines. 
Yeah. So both pregnancy magazines and just glamour magazines. Oh, and in the kind of like in the aesthetics and the composition of the of the shots and why these women even go to have the pregnancy photo shoots mm -hmm. is to replicate that or to 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 try a have and have a piece of that. Uh, so that referencing is very clear. Uh, because they all reference from that, I don't know if they also reference from each other because it all looks the same, sure. which is kind of, again, what like family photography has always all looked the same. Um, but I, ha I, don't, I don't know about the other platforms and I need to look at that. Um, I'm wondering, and I feel like you were doing this for your talk, so I'm wondering in the paper, do you do more connection between the expert knowledges that you set up at the front and how much the their the images you see and the tagging, the, the textual tagging, um, is drawing on those expert knowledges. How much it's it's very much drawing that discourse into its representation. Are you pretty are you pretty um, precise in the paper about how much you map it to what you set up initially? Out of the two papers that are this, that one is not yet really written. Okay. So I'm going to. I'm going to do that. Oh, awesome. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Work carefully. Yeah. I was looking for more, and, and I guess this is more of a suggestion for, for that paper, is being, in, being uh, really clear about how you, how you landed on those categories of expert knowledge. So I felt like I, I, I buy it, and, but you're persuasive. So I'm, what would you give me to be able to, to really um, to grab So the, that? the ones that are presented in the beginning or the ones after? At the beginning. Okay, the ones in the beginning, there's like a ton of scholarship. So other people have researched various bits of it. So that's just me putting it all together. Um, you made a really, I, I like the analysis of the Russian speaking Instagrams where we get the, the beauty emphasis and then the sort of role of the men as they're described. So <clears throat> by contrast, what does that then mean about the English speaking ones? So it's not as if there isn't sort of pressure to be beautiful, but obviously it isn't quite as dramatically like put on and make up and all that stuff. And, and what, do, what do men sound like in the English speaking Instagrams? How are they talked about? Are they, do they disappear or are they play a different role? So in the English ones, women are beautiful too, but it's just not so in your face. Um, they Also another curious um, selfie that Russian speaking women did that I didn't see the English speaking women do is getting out of the hospital selfie. Mm -hmm. So apparently uh, in the Russian culture, it's uh, an event, the getting out of the hospital. So, so all, of the, all of your family comes with balloons and flowers and everything. And you, you, like in the old times, you used to stand with your mother and father and your child and your baby daddy, and they would take a picture. So, so they do that now too, and there's pictures of that, but there's also the getting out of hospital selfie that the woman takes. So she sits on the, the uh, bed with like the old school weird back blanket on the background, and she has full makeup on, like nighttime makeup, like dark black eyes and things. And she's like, I'm getting out of the hospital. And then I'm trying to remember how, when I was getting out of the hospital, and I was like, <laughs> you know? So I mean, it's, so English speaking women are, are are beautiful too, but they're just not so emphasized in it. They do, they, they post nail polish too, um, but just less. Uh, and the men are mostly um, absent with like um, kind of like cake decoration style. Oh, I remember that this also has to be in the story. This like rare image of of cutesy baby daddy picture usually when the man is stroking the belly or kissing the belly or something um, and the the tags and captions are like he's gonna be such a good father but they're le they're there and everything that the women do is not explained through men do you see any difference in the performance by women who are planning on raising their child with a partner as opposed to women who are planning on raising a child by themselves Okay, I had two single moms okay. out of those um, 400 accounts. Uh, one of them uh, actually in her about me thing, or I mean two of that I know of. Um, one of them in their about me actually said that um, raising my going to be raising my baby alone and want to empower other single mothers. So it was clearly um, a mission for her and like an I identity. And the other one referenced it in, in captions, but it, it was less, um, it, it wasn't like a statement. 
uh, and no. So this is partly what lends to the compensation thesis that I made, that uh, even the ones who can't do all of it really work hard on doing the rest of it that they can do. So it's still all flowers and bellies and, and pretty stuff. Um. I was just going to ask quickly, um, following up on the questions about the men's representation, if you followed up and looked at if people had um, tagged the man involved, um, and if you looked at their Instagram accounts, and if there was any like pregnancy. Thing. They do tag men. Uh, they sometimes tag them with the at, so the actual, so you can link to the other Instagram, or they tag them with like baby daddy or whatever. Uh, and uh, men sometimes do post uh, pictures of their pregnant girlfriends, but it's kind of like, you know, rare among other things. So it's not like they have, a, I saw one man who had a pregnancy Instagram, um, and I was so um into looking at their story uh because they looked very young and um and i found the the account when they were when they had gone into the hospital to give birth so i kept refreshing it to see if the baby was there um and then the baby didn't come and didn't come and then the next day i came back to work and the instagram account was no longer there so it was not only not it, he hadn't made it private, but he had deleted it, which was very difficult emotionally for me because maybe something went wrong. Um, or looking at how he Instagrammed, I kind of think that maybe he posted some pictures that Instagram said that, no, you cannot post your woman's vagina while the baby's coming out of it. So I kind of think that happened, but I don't know. But yeah, basically men... Uh, do sometimes post pictures of their pregnant uh, women, but they are uh, they are brought into the narrative, the women's narrative, by acknowledging their um, part in the project by the by the tagging or the atting, which is a good point that I didn't I kind of knew but I didn't focus on. Thank you. Is there any uh, photos or data that resisted the normal narrative, like? Or surrogate, or blended families, or so this uh, is what or, or or pregnant ladies doing the wrong thing, like right. smoking or something. Uh, I this is what I actually forgot, but I wanted to say when you in response to yours, I was thinking throughout this all, where are the um, lesbians and the gay people? I did. I have one uh, woman who self identifies in her about uh, section as bisexual. That's the closest I got to, like, not man and woman. Um, and uh, so I didn't have any of that. So the question is, are they private? Are they not tagging it like that? Uh, because it's so, like, there are so many people out there who would object to this, I can see how it might be, like, a solid decision in terms of your own peace of mind not to make it publicly available. Um, and I did see one account of a woman being fed a blunt by her boyfriend to make her morning sickness go away. Um, but they seem to be really into smoking. Um, so I did see some tiny glasses of wine, but by and large, it was there was no doing it wrong.